Hey, so we're here uh, today to speak with Adam from Creature Comforts. Um, uh, first of all, thank you to Adam for coming back. We, we recently spoke with Creature Comforts more about their brewery, the, you know, the past, present, and future of Creature Comforts. Um, but today we're chatting more along the lines of our brewing page. And so more particularly, you're reading an IPA page by the time this gets posted. How to Brew IPA from Creature Comfort's perspective, a brewery that does a really fantastic job with the style. So uh, thanks, Adam, for, for joining again. Yeah, happy to be here. Thanks for having me, Marco. I'm excited to uh, delve into this. It should be fun. Awesome. Well, as we were, we were kind of chatting a little bit before we started here, the, the IPA now, it seems like there is no more contested style these days. Um, you know, it, as far as, you know, we, we kind of like used to be sort of East Coast versus West Coast, you know, now there's this new like New England and some people are putting new styles for like even Southeast regional IPAs. And so I kind of want to get your guys' perspective on what the hell an IPA is. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely changed. Uh, I think that's the first like important thing to acknowledge is that, um, you know, like traditionally, I think it was a fairly broad range of styles that were pale beers um, that had a lot of hops, but you know, traditionally probably a decent amount of malt character as well. Um, you know, maybe not clearly defined, but that was sort of in people's heads for a long time that there needed to be this balance of like, there has to be a certain amount of malt or the hops are unbalanced and it's not a, you know, drinkable balanced beer. So I think that's definitely changed. Uh, another, well, so the style has gone into a million different directions and part of the biggest driver in my mind is that it's sort of used as a marketing term in a lot of ways. It's basically like IPA has been up, you know, like 50% year over year for like 10 years or whatever it is. And so it's become just immensely popular with people and style sort of being a way to communicate to somebody a little bit about what's inside, you know, people kind of latch on to IPA when they're new at craft beer. And then I think brewers sort of realize that putting those three letters on just about anything is a way to guarantee like a lot more sales basically. So that was sort of one of the, you know, one of the forces that was pushing the style to be reinterpreted, uh, you know, maybe not for the right reasons, I guess. Um, so, you know, you've got like black IPA, which obviously in and of itself doesn't make any sense. Uh, session IPA, you know, is a pale ale as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Um, you know, fruited IPA, I don't, I mean, I guess if the base beer is an IPA and you add fruit to it, you could call it that, but I, I just think it should be a hoppy beer that happens to have fruit in it or something. It, it doesn't need to be called an IPA, but it's a shortcut in the to get to a level of understanding with a consumer that may or you know have varying levels of education on on craft beer so um you know it's it's evolved a lot um i still think it's you know totally relevant obviously we're having this conversation and it's one of my favorite kind of beers to drink um uh, just the real straight up ipa um and even when you say that, I guess that's sort of loaded, like you're kind of touching on regional, you know, variation. And, um, you know, for me, I, I kind of shoot the middle of the style. And what, what we brew is like, you know, high sixes. Um, it's definitely pale in color. It's definitely hop forward. Um, our, our version is not super bitter. Uh, we kind of focus on the flavor and the aroma. Um, and we, we do have some character malts in there, which I think people are sort of kind of hotly debating right now. And that's one of the biggest differentiators on the styles. Like, you know, some people are still putting a decent amount of crystal malt or right. Munich. And when we first started uh, brewing like Tropicalia or a regular IPA, um, I was definitely of the mindset still, you know, this is going back to like 2012 or something that there needed to be some amount of crystal malts in there. And during my home brewing days, I dialed it back, back, back. Um, and finally reached a point where I liked it, but now like, new recipes that we're doing, we're doing very little, very little crystal malt, like automatic or pale ale, not an IPA, but, um, zero crystal malt. Um, Zero Munich, um, a little bit of dextrin malt, basically. It, the idea that you need flavor malts to balance out bitterness or hop character, I just think is sort of obsolete these days. So. 
Cool. Well, so I guess that's an interesting perspective on why everything's being tagged IPA. That's I, n I never even thought about it that way, but that's a really interesting way of looking at it. And uh, I mean, you're probably right. There's, there's a lot of people are coming up now, learning about. You know, they get handed a. You know, a lot of times, I guess it happens. They get handed a Sam Adams Boston Lager or something. Ooh, that tastes a little bitter. You know, there's a little bit of bitterness there. And then what is that? And then all of a sudden they start realizing it's hops and they go, oh, I like IPAs. And so it's easy to just go, boom, tag that uh, IPA tag on it. Yeah, I mean, you've got, you've got like red IPAs, you know, it's like, that's not a style. Like, <laughs> like it, just, it just went crazy. And I think it's, you know, it, style is something that we're definitely sometimes conflicted on. Like, it is an easy way to, to communicate to an educated consumer what something is. But it gets twisted around and it, it gets misused and misconstrued a lot of different ways. So um, we don't when we go to make a beer nowadays, we're not typically saying like we're gonna shoot for this style. We're usually talking about like what kind of flavors do we want, what kind of structure do we want the beer to have, what just aesthetically, what are we trying to deliver? And then a lot of times we'll end up shoehorning that into a style so that we can kind of succinctly describe to somebody on a beer label what it is. But um, as brewers, we're sort of uh, not as concerned with brewing to style, I would say. So. Okay, cool. That kind of answered my next question because it's we're seeing it a lot with, for example, you know, one of my other favorite styles to drink is farmhouse ale or even saison. And, and we did a saison article, and, and and everyone's opinion on what a saison is: does it need any bacteria? Does it, you know? So there's all these different divergent opinions on all these styles now it's kind of leading to the question of you know is it a good thing is it a bad thing does it is it just a thing i mean does it matter if the, you can submit your beer into a gabf category or uh, it's good for marketing right we we find that to be really difficult we just went through and, and most brewers right now that are going to enter beers into gabf or sort of deciding what they're going to do and i think the beer scene is evolving so quickly um, that it's really hard for a group like the Brewers Association or the BJCP or, or whatever to really keep up with um, how the styles should be interpreted. Like one of our biggest things is the mixed fermentation, sour, funky beers only have like a really small amount of metals. I don't want to quote how many because I, I don't know. It's like nine or 12 or something like that. But meanwhile, you've got 15 shades of German lager that have three, you know, three metals each. And all those entries have like 10 people. Some of them have like five people trying for three metals. And right. so you have unawarded metals sometimes if they just don't think any of them are worthy of it. Of it. So, you know, I think that has been a challenge. Um, and so this, I mean, that's what the style guidelines are set by is, is that one body essentially. Um, for things like Cezanne, it is so broad and I think it's intentional. Um, that's historically, I mean, that, so it's a blend of like modern and historical, I think is what they're really contending with. And historically Cezanne meant a gigantic range of everything. And, and Belgians definitely don't, think about beer in these little boxes sure. um, it's very gray and there's a ton of overlap and so I think those categories really um, show the most of that because of the historical you know, reasons behind it um, we're um, I, I think it's useful um, and I, I do think it you know it could be done more effort could be put to make it a little bit better it was definitely frustrating going through because we have a lot of beers that are disqualified from various categories from different reasons and it just ends up being that we can't enter them into these competitions in good faith that we would win a medal uh, we think they're great beers but it would be dumb for us to do it so right um, so yeah i mean it, it can be useful it's definitely limiting in some ways sure yeah, I mean, I think a lot of brewers across the country are starting to think along more along the lines of you guys, you know, saying, "It's I guess that's how the regional stuff has popped up. It's like, hey, we, you know, we want to brew this style a certain way. And, you know, I guess the, the, where I'm kind of headed to is, you know, I guess an IPA, what we're getting at is it should probably be pale. It should probably be hop forward. Um, yeah. And so like there, there might be some overarching kind of like, you know, maybe I'm missing some, but there's some overarching kind of like 
things you've got to hit for it to be an IPA, and then uh, everything else is pretty much, you know, everybody can interpret a style that's very, you know, in their own way. So I guess leading into into you guys um, and how you guys approach brewing an IPA, um, I guess what's what's the first? And we kind of said now you just you now you look for flavor profiles first, and then kind of put them into a style, but for someone who goes um, a professional or home brewer says, I want to brew an IPA tomorrow. Yeah. Kind of where should their head go first? What's the kind of first thing that you're putting down on paper um, when you're, when you're thinking that? I mean, so uh, real important that we decide what kind of IPA, you know, so like if we're going in the vein of, and if we're going back to, you know, the sort of style that we've laid out, like if you're going for a West coast or if you're going for New England or, you know, I always thought like Colorado had sort of an interesting kind of thing on it. That maybe dates me a little bit going back into like 2008 or nine or something <laughs> like that, but like, it's not that long ago, but, um, uh, you know, what, if you want to brew, we could say like an IPA, like Tropicalia, which is sort of middle in my mind, like middle of the road it is, it is somewhat like New England because it's not super duper bitter, although those beers can be bitter. Um, it's really just meant to be really, really aromatic and flavor forward without a ton of malt. Um, so, you know, what? start with the malt bill to the top of the list. Um, you know, we're targeting like 14.8 Plato um, to where it's not too, not too strong. And that, that has a lot to do with where the beer ends up because it needs to be dry. And like that, that should be definitely an overarching thing. For me, when you're... When you're trying to focus on flavor of hops and not so much malt, you don't really want this sweet kind of finish because it just right. kind of gets in the way of hop flavor. So if you start at like 20 Play-Doh and uh, you don't have the most attenuative yeast or you have some other color malts in there, it's going to be what I call like flabby basically, which is just like it's just sweet and you can't really taste a lot of nuance sure. of the hops. So, 14.8, it's, it's still a good, strong, solid beer. It's going to give you like a firm body and mouthfeel, um, but it's not so heavy that it's going to be syrupy or flabby. Um, you know, uh, if you wanted to go all, all base malt, you know, I think that's a good strength to try it. Um, I wouldn't do an all base malt beer at like 12 Play-Doh. I think that might end up kind of insipid or thin, um, but that's something that we've done a little bit of, um, you know, and then you kind of go from there. Like if it does end up too thin, you can add some oats or you can add some wheat or dextra malt back up to it. Um, I would start on the very low end if you wanted to have crystal malt in there, uh, like 4% or less, yeah. uh, probably edging down to like three would be like a real, real advice. But if you're really stuck on that kind of malt flavor being in there, then I just keep it restrained. Um, in Tropicalia, um, it's something like 10%, which isn't super noticeable just because it's some bread, kind of ready, not really even toasted bread, just kind of ready flavor. Um, and we're, we're targeting like a 2.0 Play-Doh for the FG. So you want to you want to pick a yeast that's going to get it down there uh, low enough. Um, maybe get back to yeast in a minute. We'll keep going down. Um, for water, um, we do some unique things um, that, uh, you know, we use some pH adjustment, we use some salts that are a little bit untraditional. Um, I would definitely encourage brewers to experiment a good amount with the water. It's an under-considered factor for brewing IPA. Um, and actually, when we started messing around with it, we were kind of just enlightened by the differences and flavors that we can get by using like flavor active brewing salts. So. Um, you know, traditionally, people will tell you to add gypsum. Um, I don't. I don't really attest to that at all. I, I don't think uh, we don't use hardly any gypsum at all in our IPAs. So, um, for hops, um, sometimes we don't even do a bittering charge, depending on how much we are adding into the whirlpool. Um, so that might be a big difference with some people. In Tropicalia, we have a small bittering addition, but. We get to really, really high levels in the whirlpool on some of our beers, and um, you know, if we do some late kettle hopping, uh, you're really getting up there in IBUs. And for a beer like a middle middle strength IPA, if you're getting much past like you know 60, 65 calculated IBUs, it, it could end up more bitter than what we're interested 
in uh, putting through on a beer like that. So don't be afraid to completely leave off the bittering edition, I would say. Um, and we're really, really putting a ton of hops at the end. Um, so for Tropicalia, I think we're like a little bit above a pound per barrel just in the Whirlpool. Um, which isn't crazy. I mean, th this is a this is a hoppy beer. Um, it's I mean, it's a lot for I think traditional um, IPA brewing, like going back like five years ago. But um, it um, it's a it's a good number for us. Um, we're dry hopping about a pound and a half per barrel. Um, so you know that's it's again like pretty sturdy. I mean, now if you look at some of the you know, New England IPAs, they're, they're like three pounds and I mean, we, we do, or more, um, we'll do a cosmic debris. Um, our double IPA is a little bit stronger. Um, that one is 5.7 pounds per barrel overall. So quite a lot more. Um, and those beers can take it, but for, you know, for an IPA that's meant to be like just crushable everyday drinking, like a, a good solid two and a half pounds total is, is a nice number. I think. Sure. There. I wanted to ask. I wanted to take one step back real quick. Uh, sure. A big thing that everyone that I speak to now in the industry is, uh, with IPAs, most a lot of people. I mean, obviously, there's different stylistic views on IP, on, on, on on grain bills for IPA, but a lot of people now are saying crystal out, no crystal, just kick it out. So, yeah. if if we can kind of go back and explain a little bit as to you know what kinds of stuff. I guess what effect does crystal have on your beer? Mm -hmm. Could it have on your beer? And then, you know, the benefit to somebody who's never drawn up an IPA recipe before of not having crystal malt in that recipe versus having it, I guess. Yeah, um, it, it's a really, it's, it's very flavorful and a little bit goes a really long way. Um, we are always staying below 40 love a bond in anything that's hoppy. Um, we're almost always staying below 40 level on period. Um, the, so, you know, that's the, the color of the malt, but um, above 40 and once you get to like 60, um, you start to get a lot different flavors out of it. It's just these um, ends up being just darker, prunier. Like, so as those malts and so those, they call it Maillard products is like the brown uh, parts of uh, you know, the thing that gives it the color actually oxidizes um, over time and those flavors turn really like pruney, raisiny and just deep, dark, sweet, fruity over time and uh, even at 40 level bond, if you have a little bit of that in there, once the beer ages a little bit, once the hoppy, nice, beautiful, bright, citric hop flavors go away, you're sort of left with this like malt, um, just deep caramelized kind of flavor that doesn't really jive too well once the hop flavors have gone and you have a little bit of oxidation there. So we're, we're really restrained when we add it. And I, I think some people really still look for that in an IPA. The main issue that I find with it is as soon as it's not brewery fresh, um, it's, it's just kind of weird and, and off-putting, particularly for me. Um, so yeah, it is. It yeah. is a very sweet kind of character, and so like we were saying in the beginning, when you want your hops to shine, you don't necessarily want your. I mean, you want grains to complement it, but you don't necessarily want your grain to clash or over, you know, overshoot the hop character. And that's what I think is beautiful about Tropicalia is that it's you know you really do, you can really separate the hops and the grain character. And the, the, the you know the, you can tell it's a really nice grain bill. Um, it's you know it's sturdy enough for the hops, but um, it's but it is very very nice you know tropical and and, and the hops are really the, the the you know for lack of a better word the the, the main player of the beer um, as it should. So I, I I love that. And another thing is too is is that you mentioned earlier that I kind of want to go back a little bit is people's uh, I think there's been more of a shift recently to really start adding more late edition hops, right? I mean, you look at a recipe, like a lot of West Coast IPAs, for example, that was kind of like the thing for a long time. There was a lot of bittering hops. There was a lot of, you know, 60 minute, 45 minute, 30 minute. I mean, you're adding hops all along the boil. You're saying you may not even add a, a bittering hop at all. So I guess, uh, you know, how late into the boil 
are we waiting? 15 minutes left in the boil, 10 minutes left in the boil? Um, yeah, um, we don't, I don't think we ever do anything. I don't think we do 15. I think the, the earliest that we do for a flavor addition would be 10 minutes from the end of the boil. Interesting. Um, yeah, we're you're just losing so much of the aromatics. The aromatics are really what we as craft brewers are interested in from the hops. Traditionally, brewers were they pay by the alpha acid almost, and we get alpha acid in droves. We don't. It, it's almost like we're battling how much alpha acid we're putting into these beers because we want so much flavor aroma that you know, we end up in a position where we have to, like, particularly on some styles like Pilsner, we're pulling back the amount of whirlpool hops that we're able to add because of shifts in alpha acid. Mm -hmm. So like if the, if the crop has a really good year for alphas, we're not able to add as many hops to that beer as we normally would, which is kind of a weird and new way to think about it. But yeah. um, we don't do anything Yeah, earlier. I mean, we'll do a bittering charge if we need to, but then we'll usually wait until 10 minutes before the end of the boil. And I will say at Tropicali, we don't add any – hops uh we had a small bittering addition and then we the rest of it is all hops. wow interesting so, you know yeah. we have one, one thing i might add to that is like the you know you know if you have a whirlpool that's separate from your kettle it's a little bit different um than like in a homebrew situation where most people do flame out and then they will you know maybe do a quick whirlpool rest but then they start to chill um, it takes us half an hour to fill the whirlpool, and then we rest for 20 minutes in the whirlpool. So there's a lot of time where those hops are sitting in contact um, with the wort, um, and something like a 10 minute from the end of boil addition would be sitting in the kettle for the 30 minutes of transfer and the 20 minutes of rest, and it gets chilled for a half an hour. So sure. it's sitting steeping in hot wort for a really long time, um, which is you know definitely a, an important differentiation. So. Interesting. Uh, you know, that's um, that is. It's important to draw a distinction for people that are home brewing versus professionally brewing. So I'm happy you, you brought that up because I wouldn't even thought to ask. But uh, so that's, that's a great. That's a really great kind of point to make. Um, so some of these things, even you know, I, I home brew a lot, and there's some of these things where a lot of the, my friends home, uh, are professional brewers, and they'll tell me to do X, Y, and Z. And I'm like, I just can't even do that. <laughs> so, right. um, so it's it's cool. To, you know, it's it's it's. Uh, Definitely got to draw the distinction sometimes when you see these recipes online or how does this person do it? You got to figure out your kind of sometimes your own way to do it. But so we've gotten to hops. I mean, generally speaking, it's tough to answer the question about like what hops. It's just basically what flavor and aroma you want to go with, right? I mean, there's there's new hops every single day being made. It's just a matter of putting your nose in enough bags of hops to figure out what you want. It and yeah, I would I would encourage people really to smell their own ingredients and you know like the you google it and it'll give you like five descriptors or whatever and sometimes they're accurate sometimes they're way off base and i think it, like sensory is a really kind of personal experience like that what what may be piney to you maybe like dank to somebody else or just the some gets lost in translation i think um so like experimentation is the best way to get good at selecting hot varieties and sure. Like if you're really trying to learn, single hop variety beers are really, really helpful. Um, some varieties are better than others in single hop beers. You know, if you do multiples, then maybe you can blend them together, like do a blending lab, which is um, always fun. Um, our philosophy is, you know, typically for IPA that we're looking for hops that have a ton of aroma impact. Um, so some of the continental, like European varieties, they're nice and they're like they call them delicate or you know earthy or herbal and right. like those aren't the really those those components those flavors have a place in IPA but um, typically we're looking for something like I mean Galaxy to me is the perfect example it's got a ton of oil like it's like it's higher oil than almost anything um, and that actually doesn't always translate to intense aromas but it is just extremely assertive in the aroma and it's real interesting punchy pungency um, just tropical overripe kind of fruit um, so you know that plays a major role in tropicalia but it is the smallest um, uh, weight wise in the hop bill um, we kept we use citra as the number one uh, hop in tropicalia um, 
We call Citra the win button, basically. It's always good, uh, no matter what. 100% Citra beer is always good. 50% Citra beer is probably be good. Um, so it, it's the main hop. We use Centennial to sort of give it, I guess, a, a good solid citrus note and a good solid like hoppiness that is tough to describe, but it's just like, just smells like regular American hops to me. You know, that's probably just me, but I, I always think like, we've got these crazy hops like a galaxy. It can exist on its own, but it can also use some of the more like, kind of regular American hops to bring it back down to earth somehow. I don't know if that's really true, but that's how we make our hot pills. So um, Citra, Centennial, and Galaxy. And we kept pulling the Galaxy back because it was just dominant. Like it, it, yeah. it, it like a Galaxy beer. It would overrun the Citra. Wow. And with successive batches, we were going down, down, down with it. And it finally got into this cool place where it just gave um, the – a really nice compliment to the Citra and Centennial. And uh, it was, it's sort of everything fell into balance. So, you know, it's not just what hops you're using, like it's, it's combinations and then proportions are huge. Um, so and that's just um, playing, playing with different recipes. That's just kind of getting into there, getting in there and really just kind of doing it. Yeah. yeah. A lot of the, home brewers won't um, take the time to do that. It was actually the first time I've ever done that when we developed Tropicalia. Um, we brewed the same IPA recipe. We settled on a malt bill after probably like five or six batches of it. And then from there we did about like 18 or 19 batches down like a proportion of hops. So like, this is all on a, like a Sapco, like a 10 gallon brew system. Uh, we were brewing like once a week and just like, get, like literally it would change like, 5% increments on all these different hops. And, you know, it, it didn't, after the first few, maybe like five or six, we settled on that combo, Citrus Centennial Galaxy, and then it was just tweaking um, all the portions and, and everything. So, it's, it's, getting, it's getting into the, it's just brewing, and it's just, it's just mm -hmm. sorting it out. I mean, it's, is there any cool hops that you've uh, seen on the horizon that you think, well, that, that might be something we'd be interested in using, uh, like, still numbered like <laughs> yeah. um i don't so i i do um i participate in a lot of the pilot batching here i at the beginning i was doing all of it with david um now we've got david and another guy brandon doing a lot of it so they get to do a lot of that exciting stuff david also does all of our hop contracts mm -hmm. um i i get i get caught up like once a week on what they're doing um i'm i'm excited about some of these south african hops that oh, are really? Starting to pop up. Um, they're hard to get. I guess they're owned by SAB Miller. Um, and so it's tough to get your hands on them. There's a few breweries that are doing it, but like J17 is one that I've had a couple of craft beers with. That's really cool. Um, we tried a few. Um, Hopsteiner does a tasting every CBC, and I'm going to struggle to remember. But Hopsteiner has a good breeding program um, that they're. Um, we actually are just about to join uh, what's called the Hop Quality Group, which is a really exciting thing um, that we are um, going to participate in. It's a group of craft brewers, uh, basically um, Vinny from Russian River, John Mallet from Bells, uh, Jason per Perkins from Augash, Matt Brindelson. It's like a it's like an all star cast of yeah, brewers. people who don't know what they're doing, basically. Yeah, <laughs> these guys started it because um, there there was a really poorly funded uh, government run breeding program that was trying to develop new hop varieties um, that wouldn't be proprietary. So currently, a lot of the strains that are being developed, their genetics are actually owned by a company or a consortium of farmers or um, all kinds of different people so that you can't grow them at home. Uh, they're not open source for any farmers that might want to buy them. So Really, like as craft brewers, we're interested in having free, easy access to all these exciting varieties, and not you know having companies monopolize the right to right. use. So we're coming together collectively, and it's expensive to join, but it's all in our best interest to fund a public breeding program. Actually, um, that's already underway and is is developing wow. some varieties. So. Um, it's uh, pretty cool. We just are getting started with it, and it, I think it was literally like five breweries the last couple of years, and they just did a call to bring some new members in, and uh, 
excited to get going with them. But um, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, it's good that's stuff. Really cool. uh, one more plug, one more hop. Idaho Seven is really cool. Um, it's new. We we used it as the main character hop in Cosmic Debris this past year. Cool. That beer was great. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. It's one of the more interesting. Um, like it's kind of I won't I don't want to say one note, but it just has this like ripe papaya uh, flavor that's just like screamingly pungent and, and really really pleasant. So enjoy that cool. one. That what what are the, some of the the characteristics that you're getting out of those South African hops? I hadn't I hadn't even heard about these. <laughs> yeah, uh, they're just kind of wacky fruit flavors, like yeah. just really bizarre, like candy fruit flavors and. Um, a lot of just unique things that I have never. I've had a seller maker uh, get to access to some of them somehow, and so been there a couple times, and um, always interested in trying that stuff. So very cool, yeah, that's really cool. So I think uh, okay, so we've kind of gone over grain bill hops. Like I guess we're at yeast now. Um, mm -hmm. I, I know, like for a long time, people used um, you know the the Cali ale yeast. A lot that was like the real popular IPA yeast. Uh, now I think that these guys up north in the northeast are using things like London Three. Kind of, yep. um, there's that Conan yeast that's around now. So there's a bunch of different yeast uh, yeast that are being used now. I guess the, the theory behind it is you want a yeast that's just kind of clean versus a yeast that's going to add flavor profile to the beer. Um, uh, yeah, traditionally, I mean, I think the Conan yeast has a peach ester. That people talk about, um, uh, we've used that a little bit. I, I do enjoy that yeast. It's a little finicky compared to our house yeast. Like it, maybe we were just not used to using it, but um, it was having somewhat sluggish fermentations mm. uh, for us. So we we used that on Cosmic the first year, and, and now we've returned to using our house yeast for Cosmic debris. Um, our house yeast is uh, Y yeast 1968. Um, it's London ESB. Um, available any homebrew shop pretty much uh it is the most flocculent yeast uh known to man as far as i understand so um it is very different from the new england style beers in that we get a clear beer um basically on day seven it looks really clear wow uh, and so it, it just has a super strong tendency to clump up um so much so that apparently it almost does like a filtration um, on the beer. So it, it clumps up so aggressively that it grabs hot particulate, protein, and stuff and actually sinks it down to the bottom of the tank. Um, so our beers that we brew with that yeast are not hazy. Um, they just they can't be um, because of that yeast. And we've actually tried uh, with the centrifuge to even like highly oated beers, like with um, automatic, we got, I think it's like 20% oats or something like that. So you'd expect like a serious haze. Um, and the yeast does such a good job clearing that out that it just it can't be hazy. If we do let haze do the centrifuge, it's stuff that settles out like right away and it just isn't stable. Um, the reason that we use that yeast, um, it's our process. Um, we are cropping all of our yeast on day six from Tropicalia um, immediately before the dry hop. So um, we need to be able to collect enough yeast to run the rest of the brewery. Um, and we, we do want to be able to get that on day six. So any other yeast, pretty much any other yeast, you would need to wait another couple of days. Um, it's, it's the yeast I'm just most familiar with using. I've been using it for years and years and years. So I'm, I'm really comfortable with it. Um, you know, that major advantage, um, it stores well. I really like the flavor of it. It's extremely clean. Um, you know, but uh, you know, the other reason is going back to the dry hopping thing. Um, we let Tropicalia rise all the way up to 70 Fahrenheit uh, at the end of fermentation. Um, and we dry hop after cropping the yeast at 70 um, because we think that hops and a little bit of a warmer beer are going to have a little bit less of a vegetal character. Hmm. Uh, so, a lot of times people are actually cooling the beer down a little bit to collect yeast first and then dry hopping at that cooler temperature. And we think that may cause a little bit more grassy kind of vegetal uh, character to come out of the hops. So that's sort of why we use our yeast in a nutshell. Um, 
Interesting. Yeah, yeah I mean that's that's really interesting. And uh, I know I, another thing people are doing now that is is uh, dry hopping during fermentation. Have you mm -hmm. guys played around with that? Is that something yeah. that we um, yeah, an automatic. We uh, use mosaic in the dry hop, and mosaic's a beautiful hop. It's really cool, complex. It can be sort of oniony. Um, so depending on the crop, it can have like a pungent scallion onion kind of thing. And we heard from another brewery that if you dry hop like on day three or four, that it blows off some aroma, but it's primarily that pungency that leaves the beer. Um, so we've been doing that for automatic and I, I think it has been really successful. Um, people also for a little while were talking about biotransformation, but I think it's, um, so that's basically like some components of the hops, I can't remember which, are, um, trans are stabilized by yeast activity. And some yeasts are, can biotransform hops and some can't, um, but it takes much, much longer than uh, an ale fermentation would usually do. And so it, it seems to be more uh, geared towards like Brett fermentation. So that, that's been somewhat debunked to my knowledge. Um, I mean, the other reason you would do that uh, would be to prevent oxygen from ingressing and to the fermenter and uh, you know, so you're, you're opening it up, you're adding hops in, but if you've got a steady stream of CO2 coming back out, you're not gonna aerate. Uh, and then you're also gonna get some natural mixing from the fermentation. So um, yeah, we, so dry hopping on day six, um, we're not getting fermentation activity really much. Um, so we're actually manually mixing the hops up, take a pump and just recirculate the uh, slurry. Um, just to get them kind of back up into the uh, into the tank. Very cool. So. Is there any other considerations you think are worth noting for dry hopping, or uh, you know, because th there's different. I mean, there's different theories. It's cool to hear you got what you guys' perspective is. There's different theories on temperatures, and the, like you were saying, everybody does something a little bit different. So again, it's really experimentation, but it's cool to hear what you guys yeah. are doing. A lot of what we're doing is you know is based around quality of the beer, a lot of it is our particular system and the way that we like to do other parts of the brewing process. It works really well for us. Um, I would I would add that, you know, as a home brewer, I went way down this path of like trying to use whole cone cops, oh, excuse me, whole cone hops. And I just find like particularly through the homebrew channels that like they're just not as good as pellets. They don't, they don't last as long as pellets on the shelf. Um, the ones that you get just aren't really up to snuff in the aroma department. So I, I completely abandon that. And as a brewery, we don't use whole cone hops at all. So, um, mm. all okay. What about, what about fermentation now? So, I mean, there's another debate about whole cone versus pellet. I mean, if you're Sierra Nevada, for example, and you're getting those whole cone hops, like fresh off the farm, it's a different story, I guess. But yeah. the pellets are probably going to hold up better for you're some Sierra's realized the limitation of whole cone hops. I mean, they, they talk pretty openly about it. You know, there's there only so much aroma that you can get out of them. The, um, the glands aren't ruptured, so it doesn't get as good of oil extraction. Um, the storage is, is an issue. They're stored in burlap bales um, for a whole year in between harvests. So, you know, come late summer, like right now, those hops have almost been in a bale for a year. Um, without much protection from the oxygen. Um, so, you know, whole cone breweries face a lot of issues in that way. You know, Sierra does probably the best job out of anybody. And I think the biggest way that they acknowledged it was by putting out that beer hop hunter. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, they're, they're basically oil distilling hops in yeah. the field to be able to say, yes, we're using whole cone hops, but we're also using this method to focus the aromas. And so it's, it's pretty amazing. And, and not to say you can't make great beers of them, but um, I think for really, really punchy aroma, pellets are the way to go. Yeah, that, that hop oil that they're using is pretty cool. A hop hunter is a great beer. Yeah, love it. Just, love yeah, it. just the whole idea behind it too. So I guess kind of the last, um, well, sort of step along the way, well, maybe mixed between the last <laughs> thing we're talking about is fermentation. You know. I, I guess each yeast has a different temperature tolerance, but you're also considering temperatures for dry hopping. So is there like a typical um, range that you would say that you're, you're probably going to be within the, during the entirety of fermentation and dry hopping? Um, 
Yeah, we're um, for our yeast when it gets a little bit warmer, we find um, like we we don't ever let it get over seventy. Mm-hmm. Um, it gets like fusel alcohol when it gets up to seventy, so it smells like kind of rubbing alcohol. Mm-hmm. Um, so you, you never we never let it, let it get past seventy, uh, particularly in the very beginning of fermentation. Um, so we're um, cooling the wort down to sixty four. Um, and then we are um, letting it naturally rise up to 66. Um, just so basically, set when we're chilling 64, set the temperature controller to 66. And then when we get past five degrees Play Doh in fermentation, we let the temperature uh, rise to 70 by just changing the uh, controller. And that's basically just guaranteeing us that it will get that warm in, in time for us to do the dry hop. Um, so it's basically just. Five Play-Doh lets us ensure that it will hit 70 by the time we're ready to dry hop. Um, so we're, we'll dry hop on day six, we'll recirculate the hops on day seven, and then we'll probably crash cool, uh, given that it passes a couple of quality checks on day eight. So that's um, that's usually the course. And uh, for our yeast, I think that every hoppy beer, that's how we do it. So. That's cool. It's, it's quick. It's a quick turnaround compared to some of the beers we were talking about <laughs> the last yeah. time we spoke. Yeah. Yeah. No, we, um, Trap Cali, we're really proud of the fact that we can, uh, we can produce it quickly and it's, it's best produced quickly and consumed fresh. So, um, we can actually have Trap Cali out of the brewery in 12 days. Um, and it's, it's really good. Awesome. Fresh. Yeah. <laughs> it's gotta be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, yeah. I mean that's that's awesome I, I think we can talk for like hours on real like nuanced things but I think we've covered a lot of really cool stuff sure. um, <laughs> is there like a, a spark note on packaging I guess <laughs> it's yeah. like, you know like a quick um, so yeah packaging um, I mean for us um, hold on just a second um, Okay, sorry. For <laughs> somebody came in. Um, for us, packaging is all about dissolved oxygen. So um, oxygen, the enemy of, of beer, you know, except for when you're aerating the wort. Um, we try to do as much as humanly possible to keep it out of the package. Um, we found that on our canning line, um, if we carve pretty high and then foam out the beer, um, that we can kind of purge the headspace um, of the can out. Um, you know, if you're if you're home brewing, you know, obviously carefully racking to keep all the particulate out of there. Um, that's a big deal. I mean, I, you know, particulate can be really like flavor active. So if you've got uh, you know yeast floating around or, or pieces of hops or um, I mean, polyphenols actually aren't really flavor active, but like, you know, there's, there's all kinds of reasons to rack carefully. Um, you know, it, for us, it's mostly about oxygen. That's the killer. Um, and then storage subsequently is, is the other gigantic thing for us. I, we always quote the rule, um, beer is basically dead uh, in a very short amount of time at 90 degrees, but beer tastes the same essentially at 90 degrees for three days as it does at, let's see if I can quote this right, um, 30 days at room temperature basically, and then 300 days stored cold. So if you're storing cold, your beer is going to taste pretty dang good for a long time. Um, you know, if you're at room temperature, you might have 30 days until it starts tasting pretty bad. If it's in the trunk of your car, you pretty much forget about it. So, <laughs> um, it's already done. Yeah. So that, that's huge. We, we like to drive that home as much as possible. So, yeah. Awesome. I know that I know that there's a lot of stress that comes along with a professional brewery and how people treat the packaging and how even restaurants and, um, you know, bars are going to treat your IPA and especially the IPA, for example, the lines, the temperature they're keeping the keg at, all that stuff. But that's, that's a whole other conversation. But I think this was awesome. I mean, is there anything that uh, I'm, that you think I missed? See, I got, you know, um, I think we touched on pretty much everything. I mean, you know, we keep all our beers are balanced. That's one of our core pillars, basically. You know, we don't like beers that are just absurdly bitter or crazy sweet or, um, you know, the strongest beer in the world. Like, I think beer is really, and it's 
best form, something that is um, just balanced and enjoyable and, and not extreme necessarily. So, um, you know, IPA is definitely one of those styles that has been taken to pretty much any extreme that you can imagine. And I don't really enjoy most of that. So. Yeah. Well, I mean, again, we talked about it last time we spoke, but Tropicalia is a great balanced beer because you get all, you get all the hops you need and all the hops you're craving when you open a can of IPA. But it's also got that really nice backbone kind of bring it home that is not just, you know, water with hops thrown into it. You know, there's actual substance behind the hops, but they're they definitely play second tier to the to the to the you know star of the show. So yeah. you know, that's that's the goal and that's the target you're hitting. So that's <laughs> that's good. Awesome. But uh, yeah, so um, with that said, I think I think we're good for now. We're good for the IPA article and so um, by the time people see this, uh, it will be conjoined with other people's perspective on this, and it's going to be cool to see how you guys differ on your approaches. Um, diff I tried to get different styles. That's cool. But um, uh, thank you again so much. And if if you haven't had Tropicalia or Cosmic Debris, I mean, you seriously need to like either trade for it. Trading kind of sucks because you got to wait and it gets shipped and all the stuff he's talking about, the heat in the UPS truck and everything. But um, definitely, if you're in Georgia... I've had the pleasure of grabbing it at a bar or two. Uh, do yourself the favor and try it. It is awesome. So thanks again, man. Absolutely. Thank you, Marco. It was fun. Yeah. Have a great evening. All right. You too. <laughs>